So today's lecture is going to be on um, convex sets and convex functions. If you took a look at the course website, then you see that there's, uh, there's kind of different blocks of lectures on, on different topics throughout the semester. This first block is kind of a fundamentals block. So we're trying to uh, learn the fundamentals of convex analysis, essentially. It's going to prepare us for all the optimization techniques we learn and study throughout the course. So these next two lectures are, are, you know, in many ways pretty basic. We're going to talk about the basic properties of convex sets and convex functions. Some people don't find this as exciting as learning a new algorithm, but um, we're going to see this is an extremely useful topic. So once you really understand this, it's going to open the door to kind of just looking at a function in the future and saying, ah, that's convex, without having to check the definition. We're going to learn a bunch of ways to do that efficiently. And it's a skill that you can develop. So that's one of the things we're trying to teach in this course. Um, we're going to assume that you know and are comfortable with the following topics on the next two lectures and really throughout the course. And like I said, these are part of the kind of informal pre -wecs. Basic real analysis. So this is like continuity, differentiability of a function, what it means for uh, a set to be open and closed. Um, this kind of stuff, basic real analysis, basic multivariable calculus, so um, differentiability in, in more than one dimension, right? Gradients, uh, gradients of a function are the functions Hessian, which is the first or second derivative, right, of a function that goes from Euclidean space to R. Um, and basic linear algebra. So maybe the linear algebra will soon is, is a little more advanced than the other two topics, but you know, it should be again familiar to you guys. If you're having trouble with the kind of prereq material, then on the course website we have some very good supplementary um, materials to look at. So in particular for the linear algebra um, material, you can take a look at these uh, supplementary lecture videos that were made by Zico Coulter, a faculty member here in CS. They're really good. There's about, I don't know, I guess maybe 10 supplementary videos that you can watch on linear algebra that cover everything from, you know, like uh, matrix vector multiplication, pretty basic, all the way to the, you know, an eigen decomposition or a singular value decomposition of a matrix, which you should all be familiar with. So that's linked in the course website. Um, Aditya Ramdas, who's a, a PhD student in ML, he's also made a bunch of very nice um, supplementary videos, kind of in the same style, for real analysis and multivariable calc. That's also le uh, linked from the course website. So take a look at all that stuff if you're having trouble. Finally, um, your, your Che Nicole made a, a prereq sheet that summarizes kind of more specifically through the lens of optimization what we're looking for. Okay, so there's some very good materials there. I think the prereq sheet isn't up yet. Is that right? I have it. Oh, okay. So it'll go up right after lecture. So you'll be able to see that. Um, are there any questions before we start lecture at all? It can be about material from last time. can be administrative stuff. Yeah. So the online quiz was at, um, like, when is it? Uh, I don't remember. Is it, like, midnight? Like, the deadline is it from midnight? Right. So the online quiz, you didn't have to do the one that was for the first lecture. We did that together in class. But um, every lecture starting now, the quiz will be released within minutes of class finishing. And then it's due by midnight. Oh, on the same day. On the same day. Yeah. So. We'll send out a reminder email the first few times that you have a quiz today, take it. But after that, you should remember that every, every lecture, right, easy quiz, like eight questions long, basically it's released as soon as lecture ends, due at midnight. Any other questions? So while we're on the topic of um, assignments, homework one will go out this week. Um, and it's due, I think it's due. Uh, I don't know the exact date. January 28th, I think. 29th. So is that, that's Thursday, um, two weeks from tomorrow. So make sure to take a look at that. Um, we're going to try to have one homework on each block of lectures. So that homework will cover this first block of kind of fundamentals, theoretical fundamentals. And the project proposal, we'll give you information about that um, fairly soon. It's, it's really not. The first step of the, of the project is a milestone where you have to turn in a proposal. It's very kind of light in terms of the amount of work required, two to three pages. So don't worry about that. We'll give you information on that soon. 
but you should start, if you're enrolled for the 12 unit option, you should start talking to people about finding a project partner. Okay, so we're, we're encouraging you to work in groups of two or three. So start talking to some people about that. If you're having trouble finding a partner, you can use Piazza. I think there's a forum for discussion there. You can also come and, and talk to one of us. All right, so let's start with a lecture. So last time we talked about um, kind of motivation for the course. And we ended with this idea that convex, um, convexity was a very important property of an optimization problem, whether it was convex or not. And why was that true? Well, to simply put it, it's because we can broadly understand and solve convex optimization problems. That doesn't mean that it's always efficient to solve them. We, we'll see that it actually can be very challenging, right? especially for large scale problems, but for, for other reasons as well. But at least we can kind of broadly understand and give recipes for how to solve them. Non-convex problems are uh, mostly treated on a case-by-case on case basis. So instead of being able to write down you know, an algorithm that solves a wide class of non-convex problems, usually we just are able to figure out how to do it in a clever way for particular instances of non-convex problems. Understanding them is also a lot harder in terms of understanding the properties of their solutions, not even just finding them, understanding the properties of their solutions is also a lot harder. So just a quick reminder, Convex optimization problem rate is of the form minimize some function f. Um, the variable here is x. Overall values x in some domain d. Subject to a bunch of constraints. We, we can have inequality constraints that look like g i of x is less than or equal to 0 for a bunch of i's. And h j of x is equal to 0 for a bunch of um, j's. d is the common domain of all these functions. right? And what makes this convex is if f and gi, all the inequality constraint functions, are all convex functions. And all these equality constraint functions, hj, are affine, which means they look that one of those guys, like hj, looks like aj transpose x plus bj for constants aj and bj. OK, just a reminder. A very special property that we actually proved last time together, which wasn't hard, was that for any convex problem, so anything that falls into this form, any local minimizer of the problem is automatically global. So if we have something that minimizes the criterion function and any ball around itself, where well that ball includes um, any points that are feasible, which means that they are in the domain of the optimization problem and they satisfy all the constraints, then that property, just being uh, optimal in the local sense, implies global optimality. It's very important. So the picture was something like if we we're ever at a point where we can't go downhill any further, then we know that we're done for a convex problem. Um, if x of j is it from 1 to r or 1 to p, because then the equation is 1 to r and then Thanks. Yeah, it's just a typo. r and p are supposed to be referencing the same thing. So just that's the number of um, equality constraints. Any other questions? All right, so here's today's lecture. Um, we're going to talk about convex sets. We already defined them last time, but we'll kind of talk in more depth about them. We'll give some uh, canonical examples of convex sets, some of their key properties. And then this one is very important, this next one. And I mean, all these topics are important, but this is the one that I think if you had to remember something in particular, you should remember the operations that preserve convexity. Because this is the thing that you'll use probably the most often after this lecture, which means that if you know a bunch of examples of convex sets, so I guess you have to remember that too, right? some simple ones, and you see another convex set, you can recognize that second convex set as some operation of more basic convex sets. And if you know those operations preserve convexity, then you know that that new convex set is convex without having to actually check the definition. Then we're going to do the same thing, right? definition examples, properties, and operations that preserve convexity for functions. So arguably, functions are even more important than sets, because we probably use them more often in, in a sense of an optimization problem. But sets are more um, fundamental, because as you'll see, everything we talk about for convex functions can be derived from convex sets. So it's really kind of a special case of the stuff we know for convex sets. So what's a convex set? We talked about this last time, just to remind you of the definition. It's a set that has the property that if I have any two points in the set, x and y, the set being C, then that applies that the line segment joining X and Y is in the set C um, entirely. 
So if I take any constant t between 0 and 1, and I look at tx plus 1 minus ty, then that has to lie in the set if x and y are in the set. It's the definition of convexity. So here's this picture, right? We saw the same picture last time. This set's not convex because the line segment leaves the set at some point. This set is convex because if I take any two points, x and y, and I look at the line segment between them, it's contained in the set. It's a very basic um, property of a set. What's a convex combination of points? So suppose I have k points in Rn. A convex combination of them is any linear combination of the points. So it has to look like theta 1 x1 plus dot 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 theta k x k. But these weights are very special in the linear combination. They have the property that they're non-negative. And they sum to 1. Okay, so that's written down here. Theta i bigger than or equal to 0. And the sum of the theta i's is equal to 1. So if you have any such linear combination, it's called a convex combination of points. The convex hull of a set, which we denote by conv c, is the set of all convex combinations of its elements. So just to be a little more explicit, the convex hull of a set c is the set of all theta 1 x1 plus theta k xk such that k is just some, right, some natural number. So I can take any number of points in that convex combination. Um, these thetas have the property that they're all non-negative, and they sum to 1. And each of these points x is in the set C. So that's what we call the convex hull. It has a property that it's always convex. Okay, I, it doesn't matter what points I take, it's always convex. So the convex hull of any set is convex. That you can check directly from the definition. Let's just talk our way through it. Suppose I had um, two points in the convex hull. What does the line segment joining those two points look like? Well, I know each of those points can be represented like this. right? So if I had a point x, which was, say, the sum of theta 1 x1 through theta kxk, and I had a point y, which was the sum of, I don't know, call it you know, c1 y1 through cm ym, both of them being convex combinations of points in the set, then tx plus 1 minus ty is going to look like a convex, co com convex combination of points again after I just move the t through, um, say, this sum. So t times x looks like t theta 1 x1 plus dot dot, dot t theta kxk, right? And the same thing with y. Then you can just directly check that those weights in the big linear combination are all non-negative, right? Because t times any of these is going to be non-negative, and they definitely sum to 1 because we know that these sum to 1, the weights on y sum to 1, and they're just multiplied by t and 1 minus t. Okay, so write that out on a piece of paper if you didn't follow it. But um, I just kind of talked through the fact that a convex hull of any points is definitely a convex set. So what are some examples of convex sets? Um, you know, important to remember these things because, like I said later, we're going to talk about operations that preserve convexity. So it's helpful to have some basic ones in mind. There are some trivial ones, like the empty set is convex, right? It's clearly convex because the statement says that if I have any two points in the set, then something happens. But there are no points in the set. So that statement's vacuously true. Right? Well, it doesn't matter what I claim about what should happen to those two points. I don't have any points, so this is going to be true. Um, a point is convex, right? just one point. Again, because there, there's only one element, so x and y have to be the same. And a line is definitely convex. You can check that just because a line has this property being true for any value of t, not just t between 0 and 1. Any real value of t has, um, has that property for a line. Here's some uh, more or less trivial ones. So then a norm ball is convex. So if you give me any norm, which I'm just going to denote by these two double bars, um, and you give me any constant r, then the set of all x for which that norm is less than or equal to r is a convex set. That r is called the radius of the ball. So um, we'll talk about norms, I guess, later in the lecture. We'll give you examples of norms. But you should be familiar with norms from basic real analysis, right? Like the Euclidean norm or the L2 norm, the L1 norm, which is the sum of the absolute values. Um, we, we'll talk about matrix norms a lot in this class. So you'll see examples of norms, but um, if you're rusty, just go brush up on some basic um, real analysis. 
a hyperplane is convex. That's a set of all x for which a transpose x is equal to b for a given constant a and b. Okay, so that, um, right, if, if x is in uh, R2, for example, then a hyperplane just looks like this, right? It's a line. And if x is in Rn, then a hyperplane is an n minus 1 dimensional subspace that has the property that um, a transpose x is equal to b um, for some constants a and x, or a and b, excuse me. A half space is convex, so that's the same, it's the same starting form as a hyperplane, except we relax the equality to an inequality. So here that might look like this, right? So this might, in this case, um, in R2, the vector A um, would be defined as the normal to this, right? And this might be the, um, this might be the, the constant uh, half space, the set of all x for which A transpose x is equal to B. So just a line. Oops. Sorry about that. And then down here, that this is the half space set of all x for which A transpose x is less than or equal to B. Okay, so all, this all stuff should all be familiar. Just, um, we're just de-rusting, in case you've forgotten. An affine space is a similar concept, except for just for, just, instead of just a single um, linear equality, we have a set of linear equalities. So I'm saying A times x is equal to B for a matrix A. Right? And so each row of A gives me a, a linear equality. Right? So if I had rows AI, then it would, this, this set would be the set of all x for which AI transpose x is equal to BI for all i, also convex. So you can just check directly from the definition that each of these sets is convex. That's very straightforward. Here's a little bit more uh, sophisticated. A polyhedron is a convex set. So again, now we're looking at multiple sets of constraints. We just looked at multiple sets of equality constraints. Here are multiple sets of inequality constraints. So this looks like AI transpose X is less than or equal to BI if AI are the rows of A. And this, this inequality, we'll, we'll do this throughout the semester, is interpreted component-wise. So if I ever have um, you know, a vector less than or equal to another vector, like in this case, I mean component-wise inequality. So pictorially, that looks like this, right? Each of these, like I said, each row of A defines a half space this is the intersection of all those half spaces. It has to be true for every row. So right, if I intersect half spaces defined by the normals of all these vectors, I get some polyhedron P there. So we can also write a polyhedron, by the way, as a set of all x for which ax is equal to b and cx is equal to d, where c is another matrix and d is another vector. So why is that true? Um, it's just because I can just write this as the inequality that cx is less than or equal to d and um, cx is bigger than or equal to d, right? And I can write cx is bigger than or equal to d as minus cx is, big, is less than or equal to minus d. And so I can always think of that as, again, I'm just adding more linear inequality constraints, less than or equal to constraints. I'm just, I can just stack a, c, and minus c into one big matrix, and it's just one big, one big matrix times x is less than or equal to one big vector. A simplex is a very special case of a polyhedron. So it's given by taking the convex combination of a bunch of points. And those points we usually think of as affinely uh, independent. So that's the way we usually represent a simplex, although I can take a convex combination of any um, fine number of points and it's still a simplex. So what does it mean for points to be affinely independent? Well, what does it mean for points to be, just to remind you, and again, this might be just terminology you haven't heard of. If I have points x0, through xk, and I claim that they're affinely independent. Another way of saying that is that um, x1 minus x0, x2 minus x0, all the way through xk minus x0 are linearly independent. So it's just a different concept than linear independence, um, but it's it's important to know that distinction. All right, so let's just come up with a, um, an example in R2. So, um, 
Okay, so uh, let's just do this first of all. Um, yeah. Are these three points affinely independent? No? Is that R3? Uh, sorry, yeah, this is supposed to be R3. It's hard to tell where they are. <laughs> okay, well, that's why I tried to. Let's just forget about that. Let's make this R2. No, they're not, right? So why is that the case? It's because if you can think about it this way, if I look at the line segment formed by any two points, it contains a third point. So that means that they can't be affinely independent. And you can check that exactly corresponds to this definition. So in general, if I have a bunch of points and I look at the affine subspace generated by like a subset of them, if that contains some of the other points, then they can't be affinely independent. Okay. Um, so simplex, like I said, is a special case of a polyhedron. Um, the, the canonical example of the, of the simplex is the probability simplex, where we just take the convex um, combinations, all convex combinations of the canonical basis vectors. So these are the guys that have um, one and one component and zero and all the rest. And that looks like the set of all, say, vectors w that are non-negative and, and sum to one. That's a very kind of common one you, you'll study a lot in optimization problems. It's called the probability simplex. OK, polyhedra are actually extremely interesting. We're not going to talk about them in too much detail in this course. But um, one could teach an entire course on polyhedra. There's a, they have a lot of very interesting properties. We'll revisit them a bit when we talk about duality, because um, we'll see that there's another way to represent a polyhedron. So one way to represent a polyhedron is called the half space representation, which means that I can take um, a bunch of half spaces, intersect them, and that gives me a polyhedron. That's a really useful representation for some reasons. So in some instances, we actually want to know um, this representation. Like if you tell me of a polyhedron, I, and then you tell me that it's of the form ax is less than or equal to b, knowing what a is and knowing what b is can actually be very helpful to me. Another way to represent a polyhedron is to take just a convex combination of its vertices. Sorry, the convex hull of its vertices. So in this drawing, these are its vertices. That's called its vertex representation. So there's a kind of famous um, uh, theorem in polyhedral theory that says that any polyhedron that, that is, a, or any set that's, that's written as a half space, an intersection of half spaces, can also be written as a convex hull of some finite number of points, which are the vertices, and vice versa. So those two things are equivalent. Depending on how much we actually get through in duality, we might actually prove that. It's a kind of very fundamental fact about polyhedra. And like I said, in some instances, one representation is a lot more useful than the other. So it's good, it's good to know that they're both possible. Um, it's, in general, it's not easy to know one representation just if you know the other. Right? If I told you that um, my polyhedron looked like this, ax less than or equal to b, it's not easy to find its vertices, and vice versa. But we know that at least it, can be, it, it is possible to represent it that way. So that was just a bit of a tangent on, on polyhedra, but I think they're pretty important. So it's good to know about them. <coughs> Cones. So cones are another kind of fundamental um, set, and we're particularly interested in convex cones. A cone just has the property that if I take any scalar multiple of a point in the set that's positive, so if x is in the set, I look at a scalar multiple tx of that point, then that's also in the set. And I just restrict t to being positive. So a convex cone, not surprisingly, is a cone that's also convex. So that means that I can take any two points and any two positive multiples of those points, and it still must lie in the set. Was there a question? Uh, yes. Is a convex hull a polyhedron? Um, so a convex hull of a finite number of points is always a polyhedron. Okay, but you can have an infinite number of points. Right. So if I have a, uh, what's the convex hull of, of a set, right? It's the convex combination of all elements of the set. So what's the convex hull of, say, a circle <coughs> or a sphere in higher dimensions, right? It's, um, it's the sphere of the circle. All right, so going back to cones real quick. All right, a convex cone is a cone that's also convex. Put those two words together, put the two definitions together, that's li literally what it means. So you can check that this is the, this is the appropriate condition in that case. 
Um, and it, it looks like this, right? If I have any two points, x1 and x2, then I must know that if I take any positive multiple of x1 and x2, that's still contained in the set. So this gray shaded region is supposed to be a cone here. We can also take a conic combination of points. So it's kind of analogous to the convex combination of points terminology, except for the weights. We only restrict them to, them to be positive. So we don't have to have them to sum to 1. And you know, analogous to the convex combination, if I take a con conic hull of a set, which um, I guess we don't really have consistent notation for, but I may as well just you know, make it up. Maybe we'll just write it like that. We won't actually look at conic calls that often, but it probably will look like that. <coughs> then that's the, um, the conic combinations of all points in the set. And just like the convex hull was convex for any set, the conic hull of any set of points is always a cone. Okay. OK, so what are some examples of convex cones? Remember, these are actually convex sets, obviously, but they're just more special. They're actually cones. So a norm cone is um, always a convex cone. So look at the set of all pairs, x and t, where x is a vector and t is a, is a scalar, such that um, the norm of x is less than or equal to t for some norm, then that's always a convex cone. So what does that look like for the L2 norm? Let's see if we can try to draw it. This is supposed to be R3 now, not to trick you guys. So let's suppose I, I try to look at the, um, we call it the second order cone, which is the set of all x comma t, such that the, the L2 norm of x, or the, just the standard Euclidean norm, is less than or equal to t. So what does that look like? So it looks like an ice cream cone. And you guys can verify that this is correct. So it, I'm just drawing the circle to emphasize that, it, that all these points are in the cone, but it extends out this way forever. Right? This is supposed to be uh, t, by the way, and this is supposed to be, say, x1 and x2. So if I look at the L2 norm of x1 and x2 at any slice, so slice, take a slice t here, slice through this convex cone, um, I have to have the points in that set have to satisfy the L2 norm of x is less than or equal to that particular value of t. That defines a circle, right, or, or a, um, a ball. So as I, as I increase t, I just get these kind of overlapping, or, or these, yeah, these adjacent balls, and it forms the second order cone. A normal cone is something different. Um, that's uh, different than a norm cone, even though the names sound the same. Um, a normal cone is uh, associated with a set C and a point in that set. And we'll see this is actually very important. We'll revisit this a bunch of times. Um, if, I, if you give me any set, and so here I drew a set that looked like this. And you give me some point on the set. So first, let's look at, say, this point, x. Then the normal cone, as you can see, according to this definition, it's the set of all points that maximize um, the inner product uh, with respect to some vector, uh, sorry, with, with respect to the given x among all points in the set. So said differently, right, I want to have the normal cone of this set C at the point x is the set of all vectors g such that g transpose x is equal to the maximum over all y in the set C of g transpose y. So if I look at the inner products of vectors with the given point x, they have to be um, maximized at x versus all other points in the, seat, in the set. So what, is that, what does the normal cone look like um, for this point x here? This is 0. So I want to look at all, vac all vectors g whose inner product with x is, is bigger than anything else than the inner product with anything else in the set. Right here, okay, so let's, here's 0, here's x. <coughs> right, I want to look at vectors that have maximal inner product with x over all other points in the set. Should be the extension of this point. What's that? The extension of this point. Um, 
Okay, so what, if I, what happens if I extend that line? Can I find any vectors that have a bigger inner product with x? Which ones are they? Sorry, what happens if I chose that to be x and g was this guy here? Does any guy have a bigger inner product with g than x does? How about this, how about this vector here, y? Whose inner product with x is bigger? Uh, with g is bigger, x or y? Y's is, right? So that's not it. So it, it can't just be extending that out. Any other ideas? It's drawn on the picture. I'll give you guys a hint. The reason it's called the normal cone is because you can think about it as a normal vector to the surface of the set. So I'll just move this over so I have more room to draw. This is the normal cone of C at x. Right? This should make a right angle, in a sense, with the boundary of the set. And I'm actually drawing, just to be perfectly precise, I'm translating the normal cone so that it starts at the point x. The normal cone is actually defined just as a set of vectors, right? So it's actually all these vectors here at the origin. But I'm just drawing it so that you can see it more clearly by translating this normal cone up to start at the point x. So now you can check that actually x has maximal inner product with any vectors that lie, g that lie on this line, or on that half line, which is a cone. OK, so make sure that makes sense to you. Draw a few more examples. Um, and then you can also quiz yourself after class that the normal cone at this point in this set is actually um, it's bigger in some sense because it has a higher dimension than, than the normal cone at this point, And it looks like something like this. Good question. Um, so the normal cone is always defined, regardless of whether C is convex or not. The kind of amazing property is that it's also always convex, even if C is not convex. And that you can check directly, directly from the definition. Does X has to be lying on the boundary? No. X, can be, X has to be in the set. That's it. So let's, let's uh, try something else. What happens if X is in the? relative interior of the set. So what happens if that's x? What's the normal cone of the set at x, c at x? Just zero, right? It's not empty, because zero is always in a cone. But yeah, it, all, it only contains zero. So if, if the point's in the relative interior of the set, then the normal cone is kind of trivial. So we'll see that this has really nice connections to a bunch of things that we learn, like subgradients. Um, in fact, it may reappear even in the next lecture. So it's a, it's a good thing to know. All right, now moving to the matrix world. Um, we're going to talk about the positive semi-definite cone. So whenever we move from vectors to matrices, I think some students are always confused by this transition because it seems like all of our definitions were somehow special to vectors, and now we're talking about matrices, so they get confused. But um, think about a matrix as just taking a vector and unraveling it to be something of a, higher, of a um, higher dimension, right? So an m by n matrix, you can think about it as a vector of length m times n. Just do some way of consistently unraveling it, like do it in column-wise order or something. Then think of that as, as a um, vector and apply all the definitions you know to vectors to that particular object. That's going to give you all the definitions you need for matrices. Okay, so that's the most rigorous way to think about it. That's probably not the most efficient way to think about it because you know, maybe you'll spend too much time double checking that the your intuition is right. The best way is just to follow your intuition. Mostly all the kind of corresponding operations for matrices are just exactly what they would be for vectors if you unraveled them. So just follow it that way. And if you're ever unsure, you can think about kind of this more rigorous way of unraveling it. OK, so now we have definitions for matrices for convexity, just, just from that property I described. So don't be too confused by them. And we're going to talk about the positive semi-definite cone which is a set that's defined over matrices. I'm going to use this um, script S, N, <coughs> kind of analogous like I do for the set um, script R, N. I'm not sure that's the script, whatever that's called, math blackboard font or something in LaTeX, to be the set of all N by N symmetric matrices. OK, and if I look at the matrices within this set of symmetric matrices that are positive semi-definite, which I'm going to write as S, N, um, lower script plus, 
then that forms a convex cone. So in this particular case, actually, I don't have to think about unraveling every element of the matrix X, just like, for example, it's upper diagonal, right? Because this is actually a vector space of dimension n <coughs> times n plus 1 over 2, rather than n squared, because it, the lower half of the matrix is um, redundant, right? once I know the upper half, for a symmetric matrix. So in this case, you know, if you want to know what it meant for symmetric matrices to be convex, all this stuff, think about that unraveling. So what does positive semi-definite mean? Just to remind you, it means that um, if I take, right, x is positive semi-definite, which we're going to write as it's kind of curly, bigger than or equal to 0, it means that a transpose xa is positive for any a. It also means that the um, smallest eigenvalue of x is, is non-negative, bigger than or equal to 0. Okay, so if that is un, you know, rusty, then go look up uh, some of your linear algebra nodes. What are some key properties of convex sets? Well, there's really only two of them. Um, admittedly, we're not going to use them that much, so I'm not going to spend much time on them. They're actually important to prove a bunch of the stuff that we're going to just kind of take for granted. So these are fundamental at that level, but we're not really going to use them so much. So we'll just go through them quickly. There's the separating hyperplane theorem, which tells us that if we have any two disjoint convex sets, C and D, then there's always a separating hyperplane between them. So a little more formally, right, if we have any two convex sets that are non-empty and that, that are separate, so they, don't, uh, they, have a, they have a trivial intersection, then I can always find some vector A and, and scalar B such that um, C is contained in the half space A transpose X less than or equal to B and D is contained in the half space A transpose X is bigger than or equal to B. So there's the picture. So that's a pretty fundamental property. Here's a question. Um, what about strict separation? Can I always have, if C and D have the property, right, that C and D are non-empty, and uh, they're, they're, they don't intersect, What about strict separation? So can I find um, you know, some A such that A trend, you know, C is contained in a set of all X, <coughs> such that A transpose X is less than or equal to B, and D is contained in a set of all X such that A transpose X is bigger than B? Is that always possible? No. It's not possible. What, what's an example where it's not possible? Yeah, but I mean, uh, you know, these were not linear. These sets were not polyhedra. Oh, okay, the convex. Sorry, I, I was assuming that was implicit. They are just very close. Yeah, very, very close. I mean, that's kind of what we want. But, you know, I guess you can think about if the sets aren't bounded, it makes it kind of easier, right? So let's suppose I, I'm in R2, and one of my sets is just, uh, right, every, every thing whose y coordinate is negative, so that's D. And my other set, C, is um, what we'll learn very soon as the epigraph of the function uh, y equals 1 over x squared, right? So that's C. Right, so they are, um, they are convex, they don't intersect, they're not empty, but I, can't, I cannot find a separating hyperplane between, a strictly separating hyperplane between the two of them. Right, because this, the, the points in the epigraph of this set C, um, of, sorry, the points in C, let's just say, forget about epigraph, we'll learn that in a few minutes, they get arbitrarily close to the x-axis. So you can't always have strict separation, but you can under some conditions. Yeah? Uh, so would that mean that they have to have Uh, in this case, they do, yeah. The other one is the supporting hyperplane theorem, um, similar in a sense, which says that if you have a convex set and you take a boundary point, then it has a supporting hyperplane passing through it. And that is, uh, a supporting hyperplane is defined by, um, you know, a vector uh, A, 
normal vector a, and it has the pro and, a, and the, say, suppose the boundary point I'm calling x zero. It has the property that the set of all x for which a transpose x is less than or equal to a transpose x zero contains the set C. Okay, so C is contained in this particular half space that's defined to be passing through x zero. So both of these theorems have partial converses, which is a kind of amazing property of convex sets, which means that if you have something like a set such that every um, boundary point does have a supporting hyperplane, then under a little bit more conditions, that set has to be convex. And the same thing with the separating hyperplane theorem. So there are kind of partial converses. You can see the section 2.5 of your Boyd and Vandenberg supplementary textbook for that. So here's the good stuff. Operations preserving convexity. Um, and let's see, how many do we have of them? We have six, or five. Um, there's more. You can read uh, some of the supplementary materials that we put on the website. Uh, sorry, some of the supplementary um, textbooks that we list at the end of this document. But here are the five main ones. The intersection of any two sets is convex. Falls right from the definition. In fact, all of these you can check from the definition, so we're not going to prove them. Um, but they're, they're very handy. Scaling and translation. So if I take any convex set C and I multiply it by a constant A, and I add to it a, a, a vector B, then that set is convex. Right? So we're going to write that as AC plus B. So the set of all AX plus B where X is in the set. That's a special case of actually the following, which is taking affine transformations of the set, or an affine image of the set. So if I take any affine function, which looks like um, a matrix A times X plus B, and a convex set, then this, the, func the, um, the image of C under the function F, which you write as F of C, the set of all F of X for which X is in the set C, is convex. And if, if D is a convex set, then the uh, affine inverse image, or the pre-image, is also convex. So this is actually extremely important to know these two because I've, I feel like affine trans, uh, transformations happen all the time and they're, it's super handy to know this fact. It's also important not to con, uh, confuse this with the inverse of a function. So it's maybe a slight bit of unfortunate notation because f does not need to be invertible for this affine pre-image to exist. Look, it's just a set of all points x for which f of x is in D. So there's nothing to do with its inverse here. Okay, so a lot of times we'll, we'll look at affine transformations that aren't invertible, and we'll still talk about the affine pre-image. Okay, so it's just notation. So here's two things you can prove right away um, with these uh, operations that preserve convexity. We'll go through both of them. The first is that um, if I have anything that's we call a linear matrix inequality, then that's a convex set. So if you give me matrices A1 through, I guess I called it AN, um, that's supposed to say AK, another typo, sorry. And another matrix B, which are, these are symmetric matrices. Then the set of all X, such that X1, A1 plus XK, AK um, being less than or equal to B. And remember, this actually means that B minus all these matrices, uh, sorry, minus this sum of matrices. So this, me this, this means a scalar X1 times the matrix A. So I'm just scaling every element of A1 by the amount X1. So B minus this matrix is positive semi-definite. That's what that means. Okay, so just to be super clear, that's what we mean by this notation. B minus x1a1 plus xkak is positive semi-definite. So that's going to be convex. That's a convex set in x. And that's true for any matrices a1 um, through ak and matrix b. So these don't have to be, for example, positive semi-definite to begin with. All right, so how do we prove that? There's two approaches. The first is to check the definition. Right, we have to check that any convex combination of points in the set, say for just for two points, still lies in the set. So let's just do that. If I take, um, I'm not sure why I wrote down only this for one here. 
I should have written this down for two, so that there's a bit of a typo there on the slide. Let's suppose I take, um, oh no, no, I did this right, sorry. So let's suppose I have a point X and a point Y both in the set, right? That means that they both, sat, they both satisfy this. So if I take the linear combination of A's with the X points or with the Y points, they both are less than or equal to B in the matrix sense. So now I want to prove that TX plus 1 minus TY is in the set. So I have to check that um, this inequality is still true, right, for if I take these leading weights on the matrices A. That means that actually um, B minus the sum of TXI plus 1 minus TYI times AI, I equals 1 to K, has to be positive semi-definite. That's what we want to show. And that's, remember, that's equivalent to saying V transpose B minus TXI plus 1 minus TYI V is bigger than or equal to 0 for all V. Right? So just move this through, right? And you get um, V transpose B minus. Um, Actually, so I'm going to first write, first note that I can write B as TB plus 1 minus TB. I can always do that, right? So I'm going to rewrite this as T times V transpose B minus the sum of XI. I guess I left out an AI here, sorry. AI transpose V. So I just took out the T and I took out this term and these X points plus 1 minus T times the same thing for the Y's. Right? V transpose sum of YI AI V. Right? That's exactly equal. These things are equal. And each of these terms is big and equal to 0 right? by the definition of uh, pot of um, this matrix being positive semi-definite by assumption, because x and y are in the set. All right. Great. Followed from the definition. Approach two, much less um, laborious. We don't have to actually go to the definition. This is why this is not like an example where you save yourself a lot of work, because this was pretty easy. But you'll save yourself a lot of work in the future. We're just going to think about this. Um, what is this set? Well, it's actually just the affine preimage of the positive semi-definite cone. So I'm looking at the set of all matrices that are positive semi-definite. Let me define this function as a function of x just to be b minus the sum of xi ai. It's an affine function. This set, the one I wrote up here, is just exactly the affine preimage of the positive semi-definite cone. Positive semi-definite cone is convex. Affine preimages preserve convexity, so we're done. Here's another example, um, and this one is nice because it relates to principal components analysis, which we will talk about next time. Um, how about something called the fantope? So this is a set, script F, which is the set of all matrices Z, symmetric, that have the following property. Um, Z is positive semi-definite, and I minus Z is positive semi-definite. And also, the trace of Z is equal to K. So K is some constant that we call the order of the fantope. We might write it as F subscript K. So just so that you're familiar with um, right, the, some of the equivalences that we might write here, what does this mean? This means that um, all of the eigenvalues of z, which I'm going to write as lambda 1z through lambda nz, they're between 0 and 1. Right? That's because positive semi-definite means that they all have to be bigger than or equal to 0. And i minus z, positive semi-definite means they all have to be less than or equal to 1. And what's the trace of a matrix? It's the sum of the diagonal entries of the matrix 
but we also know from kind of a fundamental property that it's the sum of the eigenvalues. That's another way of expressing the phantope. OK, so that's a, a nice set. We'll see that it actually relates to principal components analysis in a nice way, an interesting way, next time. Um, it's convex again. There's two ways to do it. Approach one, go to the definition. OK, so we're going to skip that one, because we already did the, that one for the last thing. It's, again, it's, it just kind of follows from some of the properties of, of trace and, I, and, uh, and, and, po and positive semi-definiteness. Approach two, we're just going to recognize the fact that it's the intersection of some convex sets, which we know is convex. So we're going to write this as the set of all um, vectors z that are positive semi-definite. And, sorry, not vectors, matrices z that are positive semi-definite, and for which i minus z is positive semi-definite. And for which the trace of z is equal to k. So I just kind of use shorthand here right, for each of these sets. I really should write z in the set of symmetric matrices such that these are true. So each of these is convex. That's the positive semi-definite cone. Why is that convex? I mean, there's many ways you could say it, but this is, um, for example, an affine transformation of the positive semi-definite cone, right? And, um, this guy is an often transformation, uh, is, an, is, is a, a linear equality constraint on z, right? Because trace just sums the, the uh, diagonal entries. So I can think about it as some matrix which pulls those out times z summed up is equal to k. So it's a linear equality constraint on z. Each of these guys we know is convex. Intersection of convex sets is convex. It's a little bit easier to see that way. OK. Um, here are some more operations preserving convexity. Then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back to uh, convex functions. Uh, can you define the separate term uh, that looks like uh, greater than or equal than, but it's curvy? I'm sorry? Could you define this operator that looks like the, the greater than or equal than? Uh-huh. Sure. So yeah, that was here, in case you forgot. So um, a matrix is positive semi-definite, which we write with this curly bigger than or equal to. Uh, if it's positive, so this means positive semi-definite. So it means that A transpose XA is bigger than or equal to zero for all vectors A. OK, here are, are two nice ones. Um, I think we're probably not going to go through the example of this one, just for the sake of time. But go through it on your own. Perspective images and pre-images are also convex. So the perspective function is something that um, takes two arguments, one a vector and one a scalar. And the scalar has to be strictly positive. That's the domain of, the, of its kind of second block of argument. R plus plus, this means positive reals. And it takes the first vector, x, and divides it component-wise by z. And there's a nice interpretation of this in terms of pinhole cameras. I think it's kind of cute, but doesn't really do much for me personally um, in terms of remembering it, so I'm not going to talk about it. But you can find that in the Boyd and Vandenberg uh, textbook. It turns out that if, if I have a perspective function, this, this, this guy here, and I have a convex set, then the image of that convex set under, under perspective function p is still convex. And the pre-image of a convex set is still convex. Again, very useful fact. And this one is actually pretty non-obvious, I think. Um, it's, it's certainly less obvious than the affine transformation one. So that gives us some, some nice... Uh, transformations that we can also kind of keep in our toolbox. The next one is the linear fractional image and pre-image. So it's the perspective map composed with an affine function. So we know that the perspective map is always convex. What happens if I compose this with an affine function, which means that instead of taking p uh, x, y, I take p of an affine transformation of x and y. I could write that affine transformation as x goes to x plus b. I guess I kept saying y. Excuse me, I meant to say z. And z goes to cx plus d. Okay? And this is, again, the perspective map is only defined when its second argument is positive. So the linear fractional function is only defined when its denominator, cx plus d, is positive. It's the same thing. This is what a linear fractional function looks like. Um, it's 
it has the same property. It preserves convex sets under its image and also under its pre-image. So the affine, a linear fractional image of a set is convex if that set is convex, and same with the pre-image. OK, so the, I, get, I think this probably is the least obvious um, transformation that preserves con convexity in terms of images and pre-images. But it's really just built up of things we already know, right? Affine transformations and then a perspective function. So we'll see examples of these later. I guess you'll get a, a, a better feel for them. Um, go through this one in, in detail if you're confused. This is a good one. It shows that if I have kind of a, a prior set of, of joint probabilities, and that's convex, then if I take the set of conditional probabilities of one variable given another, that prior set of conditional probabilities is still convex. That just follows from the fact that it's a linear fractional transformation of the original joint probability distribution. So um, thanks for, to some of you guys for pointing out that this was a bad example I gave. So it, I, I was uh, misleading you guys here. This is an example where strict, strict separation does seem to hold, right? Because if I just take um, the set of all points for which the x coordinate is, strict, is strictly, uh, or is less than or equal to 0 versus the set of x points for which the x coordinate is strictly bigger than 0, then that does strictly separate these two, right? Because this will never actually touch the, uh, that hyperplane. So that was a bad example. But it's not always true we can get strict separation. And uh, I'll leave it up to you to try to think of a counterexample. You have a, an example you want to share? Yeah, but they intersect. Uh huh. But then, by definition, they're strictly separated, right? Yeah, so I mean, uh, there are examples that I think probably are not too hard, but it's not worth our time uh, spinning our wheels now. But yeah, you can look that up. There's, there, it's, strict separation is not always true. Check out uh, chapter 2.5 of, or something like that, of Boyd and Vandenberg. So let's get to functions. Um, functions, in a sense, like I said, are kind of more important, but kind of everything that we know about functions comes from what we know about sets. So since we knew sets really well, we can always derive things for functions. So we're not going to spend quite as long on them, but they're very important. A convex function, you already know, is one for which the line segment joining any two points in the graph of the function lies above the function. So that's this picture, right? Uh, f of tx plus 1 minus ty is always less than or equal to tf of x plus 1 minus tf of y for all t between 0 and 1. Concave function just means that um, the reverse is true. So I get the reverse inequality here. The easiest way to think about it is actually that uh, f is concave if and only if minus f is convex. So everything we talk about for convex functions has an equivalent definition for concave functions. Just define it according to minus f. Some important modifiers are strict and strong convexity. And these come up a lot, especially when we talk about um, kind of convergence properties of algorithms. And your first homework is going to have you prove some um, equivalences for strongly convex functions, another, some more characterizations for them. What do they mean? Strict convexity means um, that we get a strict inequality. f of tx plus y minus ty is strictly less than tf of x plus y minus ty, as long as t is between 0 and 1 and x and y aren't equal. So it's just this picture. The line, the line segment joining x and y is strictly above the function inside that interval. Strongly convex means that I can subtract off a quadratic function. Um, so here I'm writing as, as some constant m over 2 times the norm of x squared. So this is just the sum of the squared components of x. And that's still convex. So if I can do that for a function f, it's called strongly convex. And m is called its strong convexity parameter. So just remember, in words, you know what convexity means. Strict convexity means it's more convex than a line. Right? It has more curvature than a line. Strongly convex means it's more convex than some quadratic. And that quadratic is going to have uh, that, 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 the parameter m 
governs kind of how curved that quadratic is. Okay, so you can check that strong convexity implies strict convexity, which in turn implies convexity. So strong convexity is the strongest, strongest form of convexity. And, and then strict convexity and then convexity. Okay? So the analogous definitions hold for concave functions, just plug in minus f. And we'll get a lot more feel for them as we go on. So if you put uh, strong convexity for any value of m, it's, it's strong. So there's no parameter for this string. Sorry? Uh, can you say that uh, could a function be strongly convex where, when m is equal to half, but not when m is equal to 1? Yes. So m is the strong convexity parameter for the function. So um, yeah, it, it's paired with with the with the property of being strongly convex. So we'll say like a function is m strongly convex. <coughs> what are some examples of convex functions? Um, a bunch of univariate examples, right? We'll just draw them real quick. Exponential function is convex for any a in the exponent con uh, constant a in the exponent. Power function is convex, so I'm not a great artist, but I know it goes up less slowly. Uh, it goes up slower than the exponential function. Um, that's convex if a is bigger than or equal to 1, or if a is less than or equal to 0. Right? If a is less than or equal to 0, it looks something like this. Not if a is uh, in between 0 or 1, strictly. Um, because then it's concave. Right? So like, for example, the square root of x looks like this. And the logarithmic function is also concave. <coughs> Great. So those are some easy univariate ones. Affine functions are both convex and concave. You can check the definition is satisfied because they get equality here. Right? So it's true if I put less than or equal to or bigger than or equal to. Um, quadratic functions are convex provided that the quadratic form, Q, is positive semi-definite. So a quadratic function looks like the half is just for convenience. 1 half x transpose Qx plus b transpose x plus c. As long as Q is positive semi-definite, that's a convex function. Um, and the least squares loss is always convex in, say, x. So this is um, an important to know because we, we use least squares all the time. Why is that? It's, just, it's because this is just a quadratic function. So this is right equal to x transpose a transpose ax um, minus 2a trans uh, 2 example, y transpose ax plus a constant. And um, look, this is a quadratic function. What do we need for a quadratic function to be convex? We need for its quadratic form to be positive semi-definite. A transpose A is po always positive semi-definite for any matrix A. So least squares loss, always convex, no matter what that matrix A is. <coughs> Norms are convex. Super helpful, because we use norms all the time, too. Um, if you forgot about what a norm is, like I said, go back to some of the, the summary uh, or some of the prereq materials that we put up on the website. We're going to use LP norms a lot in this class. And we're going to use matrix norms a lot in this class. LP norms um, are norms whenever P is bigger than or equal to 1. So um, we call something like the L0 norm, for example. That's really a misnomer. It's not actually a norm, it's just what we call it. So any norm is convex, that's a fact. And think about LP norms for P bigger than or equal to 1. So it's defined as follows, right? The P norm of X is just the sum of the Pth powers of the components of X, that whole thing, the power of 1 over P. And we use the infinity notation to denote the maximum absolute component of X. Use these guys a lot. Matrix norms, we'll use a lot also. Um, the spectral norm and the, and the nuclear norm, also called the operator and trace norms. So I don't really know which one I'll use like uh, in terms of nomenclature. I guess I might mix them up throughout the semester. But operator and spectral both mean this guy, the largest singular value of a matrix. And trace and nuclear both mean this guy, the sum of the singular values of a matrix. Okay, these guys are both norms. How about some more functions? Indicator function is always convex. So the indicator function we're going to write as i sub c of x. And that's going to be 0 when the point's in the set, and infinity when it's not. That's always a convex set, provided that c is a 
sorry, that's always a convex function provided that C is a convex set. Um, the support function of a set is convex. And that's true whether or not C is convex. It's a very nice property. And I wrote it as I star of C for a reason that may look mysterious, but we're going to see when we talk about duality that there's a good reason to do that. So the support function is defined as the maximal inner product with the point x over all points y in some set. So the support function of c at a point x is the maximum value of y transpose x for all y in the set. That's always a convex function, even if c was non-convex. The max function is always convex, another important one to know. If I take the maximum of, say, the components of some Factor x, it's a convex function. So here, is, here are some uh, key properties of convex functions. And I think for these, these are, I'd say for convex functions, operations that preserve convexity and properties are, are kind of equally important. There wasn't really, the properties for convex sets like the supporting hyperplane and separating hyperplane weren't as important in the sense we won't use them as much. But the properties we'll use a lot for functions. A function is convex if and only if its restriction to any line is convex. That's a very important one to know. So if I have a, a function that's from Rn to R, and I, and I look at a line in Rn, and I actually look at how the function behaves over that line, if that's convex no matter what line I take in Rn, then that's true if and only if the function itself is convex. Here's the one that connects functions to sets in terms of convexity. A function is convex if and only its epigraph is a convex set. So just to draw you a picture, we already had an example before, um, but I, you didn't know what an epigraph was then. The epigraph is a set of all pairs x and t that are in the domain of the function um, and r. t is in r, x is in the domain of the function, such that f of x is less than or equal to t. Right? So if, if this is the function f of x down here, it's a set of all points for which t is bigger than um, what happens when I evaluate the function. So this function is convex, if and only if this set is convex. So it's an, a very um, important property connecting sets and functions. In fact, once you knew that, you could derive everything about convex functions from sets. And we really only deal with convex functions for convenience. I know it sounds silly, but everything we talk about in the class, including very complicated things like the KKT conditions and so on and so forth, they could be all derived from convex sets, just knowing this one fact. Um, Sublevel sets. So if a function is convex, then its sublevel sets are convex. That's a little bit similar to the epigraph, but t is not um, t is fixed here. We just take one t and we talk about its sublevel set at some t. It's a set of all x in the domain such that f of x is less than or equal to t. So for example, if I take t to be this value, the sublevel set is a set of all x for which f of x is less than or equal to t. It's going to be all these points. Right? So if a function is convex, then it's all of its sublevel sets are convex, no matter what t is. I claim the converse is not true. And for that, you can see some easy examples, right? Suppose this is my function, not convex, but all of its sublevel sets are convex. But if I take any t and I look at the set of all x for which f of x is less than or equal to t, they're all convex sets. What do I call a function um, that has convex sublevel sets, but uh, is, you know, it's more broad than just a convex function? A function that has convex sublevel sets is called quasi-convex. And we're not really going to talk about those types of functions, but it turns out you can say some stuff about them also. OK, here are the important properties of convex functions. Um, the first two are really the most important part. There's a first order characterization and a second order characterization of convex functions. If f is a differentiable function, then it's convex if and only if it has the property that for any points x and y, f of y is bigger than or equal to f of x plus the gradient of f of x transpose y minus x. So in words, the tangent um, to the function at x is an under approximator for the function. Right? The function lies above its, its tangent line. This is also sometimes called its first order Taylor expansion. OK, so um, just to draw a picture, right? convex function, here's x, here's the tangent line. 
the function has to lie above its tangent line everywhere. The tangent line is defined by this <coughs> over all points y. So therefore, we can immediately see that if you have a differentiable convex function and its gradient is 0 at a point x, then x minimizes the function. Right? If its gradient is 0, then this term is 0. And it tells us that for all y, f of y is bigger than equal to f of x. It's like our first optimality condition for convex functions, differentiable convex functions. That one I think you knew already, I'm sure. Second order characterization is, um, has to do with the Hessian of a function. If f is twice differentiable, so it has uh, a Hessian exists, Hessian matrix, then it's convex if and only if um, the Hessian is positive semi-definite for all x. So remember the Hessian is a matrix, whereas the gradient is a vector. Again, review this stuff if you've forgotten. And um, it's, you know, it's the extension of what you knew from, multi uh, from univariate calculus, which says that if the second derivative is positive, then the function is convex. This is just saying that in, in for, for multiple um, inputs, multiple variables. So we have to have the Hessian positive semi-definite for all x in order for the function to be convex. So we'll, we'll use these a lot. Jensen's inequality is one that you see quite often also. Um, I'm not going to really spend much time on it because I'm sure you've seen other, other courses. But uh, if f is a convex function and x is a random variable, then f of the expected value of x is less than or equal to the expected value of f of x. In some sense, this is actually just the extension of the definition of a convex function. Because right? we know this is true for um, a random variable that has, is supported at two points, x and y. Some operations preserving convexity. Um, here are three. Any non-negative linear combination of functions is convex. Why do we have to have the weights being non-negative? It's because if we had these being negative, for example, then we could make one of these functions concave, right? If I took them all to be negative, for example, it will be concave if these are all convex. Pointwise maximums and pointwise and minimums are uh, are convex under some conditions for the minimization and under no conditions for the maximization. So that is, if I have a bunch of functions which are indexed by s, um, and each of these is con a convex function for each index s, then the, uh, the maximum of all these functions at a point x is a convex function of x. Okay, so this, is going to be, this can be true even if the, the set S contains infinitely many functions here. You can check this directly from the definition. So this is nice. It's very useful. Um, it's an extension of that property that the maximum of x1 through xn is a convex function. This is actually true no matter what you're taking the maximum of as long as those things are individually convex functions. Partial minimization is also convex. I called it pointwise minimization, but that's really not as accurate as a descriptor. If I have a function that's convex in x and y um, jointly in two variables, and c is a convex set, then if I minimize out over all y in some set c, that function that remains as a function of x is still a convex set. Uh, it's still a convex function, excuse me. Okay, so this is only true if the set c is convex. So here's an example to get you to put those in mind. Um, let's consider maximum and minimum distances to some set C. And you'll see that one of these is always convex, the other is kind of only convex when the set C is convex. So let's suppose I have a set C and an arbitrary norm that I write like this. And um, no, I can draw it like this. It doesn't need to be convex. And I have a point that I write as x. And I want to look at the maximum distance between x and the set C with respect to the norm this norm. So if this was Euclidean norm, I'd be looking for, I don't know, probably something like this point, right? I'd be looking for this distance, actually, the distance between x and y, the maximum distance between x and the set. So that function is always convex, no matter what this, uh, whether the set is convex or not. That comes from the pointwise maximization rule, right? Because um, this is a convex function of x, x minus y, no matter what y is. We're maximizing out over all points y. So what remains is a convex function. It's the partial, that's the pointwise maximization rule. <coughs> How about the minimum distance to c? So if instead I'm looking for the closest point um, to x, 
I'm, I'm measuring that distance, that's not always convex. But it is convex when the set C is convex, from the partial minimization rule. OK, again, this is convex in x and y jointly. It's an affine function. The set, if the set C is um, convex, I can minimize out over y. OK, so we're almost out of time. Um, let me, yeah, we actually don't have much left. So I'm just going to go through um, the more operations preserving convexity. There's really only a couple more, and then we'll, we'll quit. So this one you'll use a lot. Just like I said, you'll use a lot for convex sets. Affine composition is something that happens all the time. You have a convex function. Instead of applying it to kind of x, you'll apply it to ax plus b, where a and b are you know, constant matrix and just some constant vector. As long as uh, the original function was convex, this new function is convex as well. This is really useful when you want to prove something's convex and you recognize an affine transformation in there. Because affine transformations mess up sometimes things like taking gradients and hessians. They don't mess them up in the sense that they're incalculable. It just makes it more complicated. So don't bother with that. Just do it for the case where there's no affine transformation. And then claim that, oh, if it, when the affine transformation is in there, I'll still have convexity. Um, general composition is a lot more uh, restricted. We can't just compose convex functions and get a convex function. Uh, and unfortunately, the rules I don't think are super easy to remember, but I've listed them here. You can come back to them when you want to check that you uh, have a convex function. Let's first suppose that I have um, a function g that goes from r into r, and then a function h that goes from r to r. And I compose those two to get f. So f of x is equal to h of g of x. Then there's a bunch of rules for when f will be convex, depending on what happens with um, h and g. I'll read the first two to you. f is convex provided that h is convex. So this outer thing is convex. g is convex. And this is the key property, h is non-decreasing. So it's increasing, but maybe not strictly so. If that's the case, then that's, uh, f is convex. Um, another one is that if h is convex, and g is concave, and h is non-increasing, so it means that it's decreasing, maybe not strictly so, then f is convex, which you could have guessed, right, because I can consider that the same case as the first one, just with taking minus g instead of g. So how to remember these? Think of the chain rule. That's probably the easiest way to remember them when n equals 1. If you take the chain rule, take two derivatives of f, you get h prime of g of x times g prime of x squared, plus h prime of g of x plus g prime, double prime of x. And now let's like, look at, for example, the second rule. Um, if h is convex, this is always positive. This is always positive, regardless of what g is. So this term is always positive. Now, if g is concave, then g double prime is negative. And if h is decreasing, then h prime is negative. So I multiply two negative things together, and I get a positive. So I get positive plus positive, which means that f double prime is positive, which means that f was convex. So if you didn't remember the rules, you could have thought of the chain rule and kind of rederived them. But here are the rules. They all, they all kind of follow from this intuition, but they apply regardless of whether or not the functions h and g are convex. Um, vector composition is the same thing. You just do it component-wise. So I'm not going to go through that. So that's it. You've learned essentially all the operations that preserve convexity for sets and functions, all their examples and properties. Maybe at the start of next lecture, um, you guys will go through this example if you find it helpful. One very last thing. Sorry, we're kind of pushed right against the end. Uh, next Monday is MLK Day, so there's no class, so don't show up. Um, unless you want to, I won't be here. Um, next Wednesday, unfortunately, I'm traveling. But uh, one of your excellent TAs is going to cover the course then. So all right, we'll see you guys soon. <laughs>